So I'll be talking about documentation creation of 3D visualization projects. And this is a really scary, large topic to squeeze into 10 minutes, um, but I think I've got it. So this is a animation of a trench I did as part of my work doing photogrammetry at the University of Reading Archaeology Department. And I think we can all agree that 3D modeling does have a place in the future of heritage. Um, for academic research, to learning and engagement. And I think we can also just admit it's cool. It's <laughs> really, really cool. I mean, I was so excited to do an animation of a trench when a professor asked me to. Um, but I think there's a huge gap in the discussion of 3D modeling. And that is, what does this mean in the real world? Because I went and I actually broke it down. And I was sort of terrified when I did it. So this model has 506 raw image files. The I just included the animation as well. And that's a grand total of a little over 14 gigabytes of data. That's about an iPod worth of data. Now, that's a lot, but once you take into consideration on the project so far, we have 140 gigabytes total. And that's not including the unprocessed image files that we haven't even gotten to yet, that's 62 gigabytes. So this entire field school, and we have two field schools this summer, we're gonna have about over a terabyte worth of data for two field schools, and we have multiple, even more field schools every year. So it's kind of important to discuss where is this going? How is it going to be documented? So curation documentation of 3D modeling is quite different from other digital preservation techniques because it's not only about sustainability, but it's about reproduction. I think with sustainability, like any other digital media, um, it's really going to be how is it going to be accessed? There has to be a strategy of making the file formats able to keep going. And also, I think a lot of people don't realize that a lot of these visuals that our people are making for nothing more than learning engagement will eventually become a record in of itself. So in 10 years, someone might actually want to look at this as part of an academic study. And then also, with these 506 raw image files, they can be used for other things. Um, we use it for social media or illustrations. But the real key with 3D modeling is the reproduction factor because if you lose this data, it's gone for good. And if the object is lost as well, that's it. There's nothing you can do. And then also if there's no record of how it was done, the reproduction <coughs> is quite difficult. So when, in my own work, I've started doing documentation and I think most people are familiar with metadata. So that's all the data that's basically produced with the modeling software. And now you can get handy printouts from the actual software itself. But what's not often discussed, and I found this within my own research, is there's not a lot of process documentation. So I have many issues with scale bars. They are the bane of my existence. Um, but with most 3D modeling software, it's not pure automation. You're actually making your own decisions based on your personal experience on how to correct models if they go wrong. So it's very important to do um, the process documentation. So I actually developed a worksheet for our program where we take notes. Because the metadata is essentially the ingredients for the rest of free. And the process documentation is really the recipe itself, the instructions. So with the reproduction, in 10 years' time, if I'm no longer here in the university, someone will try to build my model off the metadata, and it'll be very difficult if they don't actually know how I did it. So yeah, and then also you can write notes to sort of figure out, maybe in the future, you might want to do something different. And in my research so far as well, talking to people in the field, I keep hearing this kind of theme coming up over and over again, is that with 3D modeling, 
that's really going to be a tipping point. There's going to be a point where we've produced so much data and have nowhere to put it that's just going to kind of fall apart. There's just, it's just going to become a crisis. Now, there are current ongoing programs. Um, so there is the 3D icon. It's a really long name. 3D Digitalization of Icons in European Architectural and Archaeological Heritage. And that program ran from 2012 to 2015. And that was funded by the European Commission. And the, the problem with most of these programs is they only touch briefly on certain aspects and don't cover <coughs> a whole lot of detail. So for instance, 3D icons really just talked about metadata. What do you do with metadata? How do you support it? But not quite a lot beyond that. <coughs> and I think we're all familiar with the Archaeological Data Service and the Digital Antiquity Guides to Good Practice. Now that's another thing is where I think most of us have just been referred to that. If you want to do this, look at the data service. And also with that as well, it addresses the issue. It doesn't really go into depth of what it actually means to store and curate and create an actual standardized process. Now, the community standards for 3D data preservation is from my neck of the woods in America, um, but they're trying to work internationally as well. Um, they only really started this year. Their first forum <coughs> was in February. February? Yes. Um, and they are trying to gather as many people as possible to form a community in order to standardize. Now, this is my own personal kind of thing, but community. What does that actually mean? The really unique, and I think the most beneficial part of 3D modeling is that you can do it really low cost. You can produce amazing models just on extremely low budget. You can do models with your phone if you really want to. And then of course there's the institutions that have hundreds of thousands, million pounds to create 3D models. So who decides to do the standards? Because if a institution that's doing thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of pounds and they're creating the standards, it's going to make it almost impossible for people who don't have a lot of money to follow those standards and best practice. And that, I worry that 3D modeling can be, maybe become a bit elitist in the future if there is a focus on these extremely high standards. Because I admit, I I'm on kind of a shoestring budget in the archaeology department. I've had to MacGyver some systems with, you know, tape and stuff. So, you know, if I was talking to some people from these higher national institutions, and it was like, I don't have 20,000 pounds to spend on equipment. Um, and if you decide the standards, I'm not going to be able to make models because it's just not efficient. And I think it's going to really come from the sector itself. Like, they want to have a community. And I think it's really important for small museums and small institutions to get on board and to really push their thoughts and opinions and not be afraid to sort of go up against the big guys and say, no, we cannot do this. And how am I doing on time? All right, um, so thank you for that. And um, if you do want to see 3D models, just sadly I can put more of it in there, you can visit our virtual archaeology on Sketchfab, so you can play with some trenches yourself. Um, and those are my photogrammetry lessons. That's it.